Following the conclusion of the Second World War, efforts by the United States Congress to combat foreign influence inside the US coalesced into a task force named the House Committee on Un-American Activities. The committee was given a mandate to investigate real or suspected communists in positions of influence across American society. In 1949, their attention turned to the physicist David Bohm, who was at the time an assistant professor at Princeton, working closely with Albert Einstein, and whose particle scattering calculations had been used on the Manhattan Project to develop America's first nuclear weapons. Having been a member of the Young Communist League in his youth, Bohm was summoned to give testimony to the committee regarding suspected communist links within the scientific community. Bohm refused to testify against himself and his colleagues, citing his Fifth Amendment right to not incriminate himself. Shortly thereafter, he was arrested and his position at Princeton was suspended. Even after his subsequent acquittal, he was no longer welcome at Princeton and was advised to leave the United States. After several years in Brazil, he arrived in 1957 here, along with his PhD student, Yakira Haranov, at the H.H. H. Wills Physics Laboratory in Bristol, where the two physicists made a groundbreaking discovery in quantum mechanics that is now known as the Aharonov Bohm effect. One of the most important concepts in modern physics is that of the potential. The potential of a system quantifies its ability to do work. To calculate the change in energy of an object moving through a field, we take the change in the potential across its trajectory and multiply this by the quantity that couples that object to the field. For example, we multiply by electric charge to calculate the change in energy due to the electric field, or multiply by mass to calculate the change in energy due to the gravitational field. There are two kinds of potential field, a scalar potential and a vector potential. A scalar potential assigns a number to every point in space based on the force of attraction from a particular field at that point. Similarly, a vector field assigns a vector, usually a three-dimensional vector, to every point based on the forces in a particular field. The resulting forces given by each potential are calculated in slightly different ways. The force acting on an object should always be given by a three-dimensional vector. So in order to calculate a vector force from the scalar potential, we have to take the gradient of the potential, grad phi, which maps from scalar fields to vectors, and multiply this by some coupling constant, such as charge or mass. However, in order to calculate a vector force from a vector potential, we need some form of the derivative that maps from three-dimensional vectors to three-dimensional vectors. For this, we use the curl. Furthermore, there are several identities from vector calculus of which we will take note. First, that the curl of the gradient of any scalar field is always zero and second, that the divergence of the curl of any vector field is also zero. The proofs of these are easy to derive and can be found in any book on vector calculus. Using these identities, we can see that expressions for the electric and magnetic potentials arise naturally from Maxwell's equations. Specifically, the equations that we're going to use are Maxwell's second equation, which says that the divergence of the magnetic field is always zero, which you can intuitively think of the same, that a magnetic field is always that sort of spherical shape where the field lines come out at the top, they arc round in the sphere and come back in at the south pole. And we will also use Maxwell's fourth equation, which says that the curl of the electric field is equal to the negative of the time derivative of magnetic field. Which basically says that a uh, changing magnetic field will produce an electric field around it. We then combine these with two identities. So with this, we compare it to our identity that the divergence of the curl of any vector field is always zero. And that seems to imply to us that we should be able to write the magnetic field as the curl of a magnetic vector potential. We can then substitute this expression for the magnetic vector potential into our magnetic field here. So we will have that this is equal to the negative time derivative of the curl of the magnetic 
And now comparing this, we rearrange the, our positioning of the time derivative. We can see that we have a curl on both sides. So we want to find some way to cancel the curl. But if you think about this in terms of derivatives, if we have a derivative of one thing is equal to a derivative of another thing, we can't just cancel the derivatives because there could be some constant coming. And this is where we use the second identity that I mentioned. That identity says that the curl of the gradient of some scalar potential is equal to zero. So the gradient of the scalar potential is going to be the constant that comes out when we get rid of the curl in this expression. So we will find that the electric field is equal to minus the gradient of some scalar field minus the time derivative of the magnetic vector potential. And this scalar potential here is the electric potential. We find, however, that there is some freedom in the exact values for the electric and magnetic potentials phi and A that we want to choose. So, suppose instead of our magnetic vector potential A, we chose some A prime, which we are going to define to be A plus the gradient of some scalar field which we call lambda. Then, when we take the curl of this new vector potential A prime, that's going to be equal to the curl of our original A plus the curl of some gradient of a scalar field. And we know from our identities earlier that the curl of a gradient is always zero. So this returns to us our original curl of A, which is just the magnetic field. So the, the values of the magnetic field, which is the observable quantity here, are actually un invariant under this transformation. So now let's try and work out, if we do this transformation, how we have to transform phi in order to get back our original observable values for the electric field E. We had our expression that E is equal to the gradient of the electric scalar potential phi take away time derivative of A. So let's make A A prime and see what happens. So we get minus the time derivative of the original A take away the time derivative of the gradient of this new scalar field lambda. So you can see if rather than the original phi here, we'd instead chosen some phi prime, which is equal to phi plus the time derivative of lambda, then when we take the gradient of phi prime, we will get our original gradient plus the time derivative of the gradient of lambda. So if you substitute this into this expression for E, you will find that we then return exactly the same expression for E that we originally had. Now these kinds of transformations for the potentials are called gauge transformations. And the invariance of these observable quantities, e, e and B, is known as gauge invariance because they're invariant under these gauge transformations that we've chosen. So the next thing that we're going to look at is putting all of this into a sort of quantum mechanical picture. We want to know what happens to wave functions and what happens to the Hamiltonian in the Schrodinger equation when you do these gauge transformations. So that's what we're going to be looking at now. Now let's try and move into a more quantum mechanical picture of electromagnetism. Recall the Schrodinger equation, which says that IH bar times the time derivative of the wave function is equal to the Hamiltonian operator 
acting on that wave function. Now the form of the Hamiltonian that you will probably be most familiar with is this form. You should have seen minus h bar squared over 2m times gradient, or perhaps if you're still quite a beginner, maybe the second derivative with respect to x of the wave function plus some scalar potential v times the wave function. Now this you can also have written a ground squared. Now the reason why this operator comes in is we, because we define a momentum operator which is minus i h bar times the gradient or in the one dimensional case minus i h bar times d by dx. And then this expression here becomes the kinetic energy because it should simply turn out to be p squared over 2m, which is exactly uh, the kinetic energy from classical mechanics. The problem is that this form of the Hamiltonian for the Schrodinger equation doesn't include magnetic vector potentials. So although there's a scalar potential here that we could use to include our scalar electric potential, we don't have the magnetic vector potential in here. So what we want to do is find some way of coming up with a new momentum operator, or a new Hamiltonian if you like, from classical mechanics that does include both the magnetic and the electric potentials from classical mechanics. So let's now try and reconstruct the Hamiltonian from scratch to involve electric and magnetic fields. Now this is quite a difficult bit, uh, so hopefully I'm not going to make any mistakes. So let's get going. So you might remember if you've done Lagrangian and Hamiltonian mechanics that we have this definition that the Hamiltonian is equal to velocity dot the canonical momentum. So that's not the classical momentum uh, MV. This is the momentum that's derived using Lagrangian mechanics where P is equal to dL by dx for our coordinate x, take away the Lagrangian. So what we want to do is try and come up with a Lagrangian for electromagnetic fields that we can use to calculate a canonical momentum and a Hamiltonian. So we have this expression for the total force from electric and magnetic fields that F is equal to Q times E plus V cross B. So once we can find an appropriate Lagrangian to use, then we should be able to use the Euler Lagrange equation to calculate this equation of motion for the force. So if you can remember, the Euler Lagrange equation is d by dt of dl by d x dot uh, of i for each different coordinate minus dl by dx i is equal to zero. So i just indexes over the different coordinates that we've got. And we could equally have written, rather than x dot here, we could have written v i. So we need to get the right Lagrangian to use here in order to get this equation of motion back. And this is where the here's one I made earlier moment is going to come in. Uh, so I'm going to give you a Lagrangian, and then I'm going to show that it works. So the Lagrangian that we're going to use is L is equal to half mv squared minus qv, or phi here, we could have, for our electric scalar potential, plus q v dot a. So that is the Lagrangian that we're now going to use in order to derive this equation of motion and to get our Hamiltonian for this electromagnetic system. So let's first just write a component x for this Lagrangian. Uh, very simply, the, the x component of it is going to be half m vx squared minus q phi plus q 
bx ax. Sorry, that's sort of getting to the edge of the blackboard now. So let's take the derivative with respect to velocity x of this, because we know that the y and z parts of the Lagrangian will only have velocities in the y and z direction. So when we take the derivative with respect to vx, those will be zero. So for now, we can just only study this thing. So we want to know dl by d vx. That's clearly going to be m vx, differentiating the vx squared, plus q a. a long time. Uh, so the next thing that we need to do is take the time derivative of this expression here. So I might do this on the first board because it's not going to take too long. So the time derivative of this thing, dl by dvx, this thing here, so that's mvx to qax equal to m dv x by dt plus q d a x by dt. Now an interesting thing to note here is that this is the total derivative of ax, not the partial derivative of ax. So what we can do is we can try and rewrite this in terms of the partial derivative. It's because if you remember in our expressions for the uh, scalar potential and the vector potential, we involved uh, partial time derivatives in those expressions. So we want to get back to something that's got partial derivatives of time over the potentials. So very simply, you can just use this expression for the total derivative that you might have seen before expanding it out in terms of partial derivatives. So we get q times total derivative dx by dt of the partial derivative ax by dx, and then the total derivative dy by dt times the partial derivative ax by dy. Same for z, total derivative z with respect to t, partial derivative of ax. Sorry, this is sort of getting to the edge of the board. And then when we get to the time part, we'll get a time derivative with respect to time, of time, which is just 1, times the partial derivative of ax by dt. So sorry that that's sort of getting right to the edge of my board. It's not going to get any better. Um, right, so remember this expression. Because now what we're going to do is we're going to try and find the derivative of L with respect to a coordinate x. So dl by dx is going to be equal to when we take the derivative of this part, it's only got velocities, when the velocity of the derivative of the velocity with respect to a coordinate is always zero, then we can take the partial derivative of this scalar potential phi, because that does depend on position. And then for this term, the velocity is constant with respect to the position, but the potential A might not be. So let's go ahead and do that. So we get minus Q the phi by the X plus Q times the derivative so it's x and phi dot a, which 
it's just going to be Vx times Dax by Dx plus Vy times Day by Dx. Let's go ahead and write all this out. That's Vx times Dax by Dx plus Vy Day by Dx plus Vz Dax. So now that we've got these two expressions, this expression for dl by dx and this expression for dt of dl by dv, we can combine the two of them, take one off the other, and set it equal to zero, and then we're going to see what we get. So in the first equation, we had this term. Um, dvx by dt. And then I'm going to do some combining of, of, of terms uh, as I go, I think, just so that I have space to write everything in. So we had a load of terms here, and each of them are attached to a time derivative of a coordinate. So that's vx, that's vy, and that's vz, which is looking a lot like this expression here. So I'm going to try and combine the two of those together, but I'll do that last. We have another term here which we can add on, which is dAx by dt. And then we have this term, minus q d phi by dx. And then these two terms that we're going to combine. So it's plus q times the positive of each of these, so it's positive vx d ax by dx minus, sorry, I should have a minus sign there, minus q of vx times d ax by dx, which is just the same expression. So the, the first one cancels, and then for the next one, we will get vy from both, and we're going to get here dax by dy minus day by dx. And then from the vz terms, we've got dax by dz. Minus daz by dx. Now, if you look at this term here, this is a time derivative of velocity, so that's just an acceleration. So ma is a force. So this could be the force that we were originally looking for in this expression. So let's just move this m dvx by dt over to one side, which will put a minus sign in front of everything else. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and write the whole thing out. Alternate signs of these, so that's D A Y and DX, and it's D A X and D Y. It's B Z D A Z by DX minus D A X. might have had a rogue minus sign show up here somewhere. Right, there was a couple of 
errors to do with negative signs coming up in the wrong places here. So I'm just going to tell you what the mistake was that I made. Um, so this was correct. This should have been a plus sign originally, and then when you subtract, you get minus signs on these two terms here. But then when we were subtracting d l by dx, this should have become a plus. So then when we move the two of these to the other side of this expression, that that thing is equal to zero, both of these will get minus sign in front of them. So I could just write a plus and then big brackets around each of those. Um, and this term also should have a bracket around it. I missed that the first time I wrote it. So this thing actually has a Q in front of it, which means that I can bring the Q out in front like that. Uh, so if you ever make stupid mistakes when you're doing a calculation like this, that's completely normal. It happens to the best of us. Um, now this, I'm pretty sure, is the correct expression. This is what we were looking for. So, what we can do is we can try and identify different parts of this equation with things in here. Um, so first of all, let's look at the electric field. We had our definition for the electric field being minus grad of some scalar field minus d a i d t. Um, and what we've got here is precisely q times that, right? Uh, and then just taking the x component will give you exactly this expression here. So we've managed to get as far as a force and q e. And then this long thing will turn out to be q times v cross b. Um, because these two terms if you look at them carefully, you'll see they come from the curl of A. And then when you take V cross A, which has these Y and Z components, um, you will have to ignore, uh, if, if you're just looking at the X component, then that won't be including a VX term, that will only be including a VY and a VZ term multiplied by the Y and Z components of the curl of A. So if you work out exactly that expression, this will give you this thing here, which is Q V cross B. So we've got there. We've been able to show that the Lagrangian that I suggested to you a few minutes ago will return our original equation of motion. So what we now want to do is use the Lagrangian, which we know is correct, to calculate a canonical momentum and work out the Hamiltonian. So let's do that. I'm going to wipe these boards. So now let's use our Lagrangian to calculate the canonical momentum and work out the Hamiltonian. I think I made a mistake when I gave you the definition of the canonical momentum. This here should have been an x dot. We differentiate with respect to the velocity. So let's just do this along some direction x. And then that will give us the x component of the canonical momentum. So we can then extrapolate to find the whole vector. So Lx is equal to our half and vx squared minus q by plus q vx ax. So if we differentiate this with respect to vx, we get mvx. This thing cancels because it doesn't depend on vx. Remember, this thing is a function of the x, y, and z coordinates, but not of the velocities along those axes. So this is constant. And then we get rid of vx with this expression to be left with q ax. Now that is our canonical momentum. And then we have this expression that the Hamiltonian is equal to v dotted with the canonical momentum Take away L. So this is Px canonical. So we can use this to work out the Hamiltonian. So H 
do it wherever I've got more space. H is equal to V dotted with the vector form of this, which is going to be MV plus QA minus the Lagrangian in the full form. So that's minus a half MV squared plus Q5 minus Q B dot A. Now notice that there's going to be some things cancelling here. This is MV squared. This is minus a half MV squared, so we'll get left with just plus a half MV squared. And then plus V dot Q times V dot A minus Q V dot A will give us zero, so we just get left with this part here, Q of. And we can then substitute our expression for the canonical momentum back in here, because we know that MV from this expression is equal to uh, the canonical momentum P minus Q A. Then substituting this back in here will give us that the Hamiltonian is equal to 1 over 2m times p canonical minus qa squared plus q5. So then, in order to write down a Schrodinger equation using a Hamiltonian like this, all that we need to do is promote each of these things to operators that act on the wave function. Um, so something like the scalar potential operator just acts on the wave function by multiplying the wave function at every point by the scalar potential there. This momentum here is the interesting thing though. We're going to need to promote this to the quantum mechanical momentum operator minus IH bar rad. So in total this will give us a Hamiltonian that we can use in the Schrodinger equation that involves both the magnetic and the electric potentials. So what we're now going to do is study that Hamiltonian that involves the potentials and study what happens when you do a gauge transformation on those potentials and figure out what happens to the wave function under the gauge transformation. So returning to what we've built up, We've managed to derive this Hamiltonian for the Schrodinger equation, which includes the magnetic and electric potentials. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a, a gauge transformation on these potentials, as we defined earlier. So A will get sent to A plus grad of lambda, where lambda is some scalar field, and phi gets sent to phi prime, which is phi plus d lambda by dt. Now, what we want to do is try and work out what transformation we have to do to the wave function so that when we do the gauge transformation on the potentials we can then transform the Schrodinger equation, the, the wave function as well to get back to the same expression of Schrodinger equation so something that isn't going to involve this gauge lambda. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hypothesize what the right transformation to use is, and then I'm going to prove to you that it's correct. So what we're going to do is we're going to guess that the transformation should be e to the i lambda q over h bar psi. And then what we now need to do is substitute all of this into the wave function. Uh, and I'll show you what happens. So first of all, sorry, into the Schrodinger equation. First of all, I'm going to substitute into the right-hand side. So this is the right-hand side. This is left. So in the right hand side, we have to change a to a prime. So we substitute in this and change phi to phi prime. So substituting in that. Um, but for now, I'm just going to study this bracket here uh, because that's where most of the complicated things going on. Here, you'll just get two different expressions rather than one. But we're going to take a closer look at that. Sorry, that should have been a squared there. So let's look at this bracket. 
consider just one of them first of all, rather than the squared, and consider what happens when you act with the bracket including a prime. on this transformed wave function psi prime. What happens when we bring this thing here inside the bracket? Well, this doesn't act on the wave function, so that's not going to change. This doesn't act on the wave function either, other than by these things just multiplying by a factor. But this operator does. So, if we bring the whole thing inside, then we'll get the grad operator acting on both of these. So we do a product rule, uh, and we get minus ih bar times the wave function times grad operating on this thing. Plus, or minus even, ih bar times this factor times grad operating on the wave function. And then we just add on, or in this case subtract, the other terms here. And that's what all of that bracket will become. So let's look at what we're actually doing to this. So if you take the derivative of an exponential, you'll get the exponential back out. And then you take the derivative of the bit inside. And the only thing here that depends on position is this scalar field lambda. So we get minus ih bar psi times by the whole factor times by the derivative of the inside, which is going to be i q over h bar rad lambda. Now, if you look at this carefully, that cancels with that, the i cancels with the minus i, and you get left with q rad lambda times e to the i lambda q i lambda q over h bar psi which is exactly the same as this term here but without a minus sign so these two things cancel and you just get left with e to the i lambda q over h bar times the original bracket without the gauge transformation. So then when we do it with the squared bracket, you do it again, and you pull out this factor in front of the whole squared term. So when the operator here, involving the gauge transformed magnetic potential, acts on the gauge transformed wave function psi, then you just pull out the factor from psi to the front, uh, and get left with the original non-gauge transformed expression. So now let's move on to looking at the left hand side. So the left hand side is minus i h bar d psi prime this time by dt, which is minus, sorry, plus i h bar, plus i h bar d by dt of e to the i lambda q over h bar psi. And then once again, we do a product rule on this. So we get i h bar psi d by dt of the factor plus i h bar times the factor 
d sine by dt. So what's going on here? Well, we will get the same factor back out. Again, very similar to last time, times by the derivative of the inside, which is i q over h bar d lambda by dt plus this thing here. And doing some simplification, we get left with a minus sign, the h bars cancel, and we get left with, as you may see, what happens when we plug in phi prime in here. So just into that part, you'll get the q phi prime times psi prime is equal to q bracket phi plus d lambda by dt and then the transform wave function. But here we've also got a q times a derivative of lambda with respect to t and here the transformed wave function. So these two terms will cancel and Hopefully, you can see from that clearly that you should get uh, the original wave function back out. Um, the only thing that I'm missing is I think, then again, there might be a minus sign that's showed up in the wrong place. Um, let me have a minute to think about that. Right, I've spotted where that incorrect minus sign was. Easy to say to make. That should have been a minus sign there. So when we do the transformation here, we get a minus sign coming in. So in front of the d lambda by dt, there should be a minus sign on the right hand side. And this part, which refers to the left hand side, had an i times an i, which gives us this minus sign in front. So we've also got a minus sign in front of the d lambda by dt. So correct signs on both sides, those terms cancel, and you will just get left with this term, with the factor at the front, this term here, because that's cancelled with that, with the factor at the front, and this term here, with the factor at the front. So this factor that transforms the wave function will cancel from each, uh, and we'll get left with the same expression for the Schrodinger equation if we do this total gauge transformation on all of those things. So now that we've got this expression for how to gauge transform the wave function, we can actually start studying what the aharonov bohm effect actually is. In the aharonov bohm effect, we study systems where the magnetic field is zero almost everywhere. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that the potential A has to be zero everywhere, right? A could be a constant of some kind, defined in such a way that when you take a curl of it, the magnetic field is equal to zero, even though the magnetic vector potential A is not. The interesting thing here is that, although there's no magnetic field, the vector potential A will still show up in the Schrodinger equation. Uh, and the form of the Schrodinger equation that I've written here is neglecting the electric potential because that isn't that relevant to this particular study of the aharonov bohm effect. So what we do when we study this effect is we want to try and do a gauge transformation, as we explained before, on psi in order to get rid of the magnetic vector potential altogether from the Schrodinger equation to make it much easier to solve. So what, we, what we're going to do is we're going to do a transformation on psi very similar to the kind of things that we discussed before. So the transformation to psi prime is going to be e to the i g 
or rather psi is equal to e to the ig times psi prime, and we can substitute this expression for psi into the Schrodinger equation, where g is defined to be this. g of r, so it depends on position, is equal to q over h bar, so you can sort of see uh, the i q over h bar times lambda coming in to this gauge transformation here, times by the integral over a path from some arbitrary origin point, which we'll call O, to the position R of A over some coordinate along the path. Now, interestingly, this only applies when in the entire region that we're studying, the curl of A is equal to zero. Now, you may have seen in a vector calculus course that paths of curl-free fields are independent of the path. They're only dependent on the endpoints. Uh, so if you take a gravitational field, for example, this is a curl-free field. And if you want to work out the amount of energy in order to change your orbit by two different heights around the Earth, all that you need to know is the difference in the heights. You don't need to know where you are above the Earth, right? It, it doesn't cost more energy in order to launch a rocket out in one direction from the Earth, as long as you're going straight up to a different direction, right? It's, it's path independent. Um, exactly the same thing is going on here. So we only need to consider the start and end point of the path. Um, and this origin point is just something that we can choose arbitrarily, right? Uh, if we were to choose a different origin point, we'd just get some constant coming out in front of this, which would change uh, the wave function by a phase factor. But um, for, this, for the sake of argument, we'll just call it O, uh, and we could have chosen anything here. It's, that's kind of like a frame of reference thing. Um, if you change the frame of reference, it doesn't change the physics. Uh, so in this case, the frame of reference is defined around this origin point O. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try and substitute this thing back into the Schrodinger equation. So let's look at the left-hand side. Um, and let's take the gradient of psi, just for the sake of argument. You'll see why in a minute. So the gradient of psi is the gradient of all of this. And we use the product rule to do that. will give us the gradient of this thing times psi prime plus the phase factor times the gradient of psi prime. Now what's the gradient of this phase factor? Well if you take the gradient of this you get e to the ig times i times the gradient of g. Now, g is this integral here, dependent on r. If you take the gradient of the integral, you just get the integrand back out. So the gradient of g is simply a, q, or rather q over h bar times a. So when we look at momentum operators, we look at minus i h bar times the gradient. So let's times this whole thing by minus i h bar and see what we get. First term, we will get minus i times i, that's plus. The h bars cancel and you just get left with q e to the i g a, and there's a sign. Plus minus i h bar, which is minus i h bar e to the i g times the gradient of c. So now we have an expression for the gradient of psi, or rather minus i h bar times the gradient of psi. So next, let's now look at this whole bracket. What's that going to do? Well, 
we will, if you ignore the squared for now, the action of the bracket on the wave function will be to do minus a to bar times the gradient, which is this thing, and then take away q a times the transformed wave function, which will cancel with this part. So now we found out that when we act with this whole bracket once on the, the wave function, we will just get this factor of i g coming out in front of the gradient of the transformed wave function. So this is how we lose the magnetic vector potential from this, because when you act with the bracket involving both minus i h bar grad and the magnetic vector potential, you get this cancellation because a part including the vector potential comes out from the gradient operator acting on the untransformed wave function. So if you can imagine doing that twice, what are we going to get? Well, we're going to get all of this thing, uh, all the, these prefactors squared, and this part squared as well, I believe. Um, Yes, you will, you will square all of the prefactors uh, and the operator here as well. So what you will find is that the left-hand side of this will transform into all of this squared, which is minus h bar squared, and then there's the over 2m factor that we need to include from here. Uh, my e to the 2ig times rad squared of psi. And now let's have a look at the right hand side. What's the right hand side going to do? Well, it's going to be ih bar times the time derivative of this. Now I'm slightly concerned that I might have made a mistake uh, with this. Part. I'm not sure whether that's an e to the 2ig, um, so we're going to be clever about this, and I'll leave it like that for now, and then we'll have another look, depending on what the right-hand side of this expression comes out as. So we use the product rule on this, um, and in fact, this g here is time invariant, so this prefactor is just a constant, so I was right about the error that I've made because this is a constant, so it just comes out to the front. You get left with d psi prime by dt. So this shouldn't have been a squared factor here. Um, and the reason why it isn't, sorry, is because, yeah, we've, this is already including, um, the, this has got like an e to the ig and a psi prime in it. So when you act with another um, gradient, what it will basically do is it'll do the same thing. So it'll pull this out and then act with another gradient operator on the gradient of psi prime that we have already. So that shouldn't be the two. Uh, I was right about that error. Uh, so sorry about that, that was a little mistake. Um, so hopefully that's clear as to, as to why I accidentally made that error. Um, seems to have been a lot of little plus or minus errors today, lots and lots of calculations to do. Um, but it's given us this result at the end, which shows that the left-hand side is like the left-hand side of the normal Schrodinger equation, but involving this phase factor here, and same on the right-hand side. So if you just cancel both of these, then this gives you the normal left-hand side of the Schrodinger equation with no potentials, and this is the time derivative part of the Schrodinger equation from the right-hand side. So this has shown us that for a curl-free uh, potential field, we've been able to gauge transform out the field from the Schrodinger equation, and in doing so, we had to multiply the, the wave function by this phase factor. Now this looks like a really minor thing. You look at this and you think, why is this interesting? All that we're doing is we're doing gauge transformations on wave functions uh, in order to transform the Schrodinger equation between different pictures, if you like. But this phase factor coming out in front of the wave function 
can actually have some interesting physical consequences if we study real uh, magnetic fields that only exist uh, at a certain point and a zero everywhere else, i.e. in fields where uh, the magnetic field is zero in a certain region, you can still have wave functions there and they will have to involve this transformation factor e to the ig. So we're going to look at a real physical example of such a system next. The physical system that we're going to study is a solenoid. So this is a coil of wire that generates a magnetic field in the inside. And if you recall what magnetic fields look like, at the centre of them sort of look like this, and then they arc round like that. And what you find is that in the region, very close to the core and near the middle, uh, sort of vertically off the solenoid, around here, as in these areas, the magnetic field is very small. And the longer you make it, the smaller the ma that magnetic field will get, until eventually, in all of the region to the side of the centre of the solenoid, we have that the magnetic field is zero. So a way to sort of quantify this in a potential is to use a vector potential phi over 2 pi r times a unit uh, vector around the angle of the circle. Um, so this phi is the flux through the solenoid, and the way to show from this that uh, there's magnetic, the magnetic field is zero everywhere else, apart from at the centre, is if we take the curl of this expression and we integrate it around some sort of circle like that, around the centre, then we can use Stokes' theorem to transform that into an interval around the boundary, so that's just around the boundary of this circle of A itself by DL. Uh, and if it's a circle, then we just get 2 pi r from the DL, because that's the circumference of the circle, times by this potential. So as long as we're not at the centre, the r's will cancel, um, and then the phi unit vector was involved with this integral here, with the dot product, basically. So what that means is that the flux that we get through some circle around the centre of the solenoid doesn't depend on how far away we, uh, like it doesn't depend on the diameter of that circle. So we can make it as close to the centre as we like, or, or as far away, um, and we'll still get the same flux, which means that the magnetic field has to be entirely localised at the centre, and there must be no magnetic flux anywhere else. So this is sort of a, a way of modelling that, basically. So now what we're going to consider is using this expression for G that we had earlier. Which is defined over some path through the region where the magnetic field is zero. And if you look at this, we now know that there's a region where the magnetic field must be zero. Then what happens if we pick two different paths? Let's say one of them is a path that goes around the solenoid like this by 180 degrees or 2 pi radians if you like and the other one goes around the back like that. So let's consider what happens between those two paths. So what we're going to do is calculate what G is for the two different paths that you could take of your particle that's described by this wave function around the centre of that solenoid. So, substituting in our expression for the magnetic vector potential, we get that GR is equal to Q over H bar times the integral over our path of A, which is phi over 2 pi r phi prime, and in fact you can take these constants outside the integral, dotted with um, the element dr, which is a vector, turned into just a one-dimensional form around the angle, which is r 
phi hat the unit vector d phi. So you can work that out using educate in polar coordinates. So let's take the constants out in front and see what we get left with. And then inside the interval, we get an R multiplied by an R, and we know that we can't be at the centre because that's where the magnetic field is not zero. So R is never zero, so that's all holds. We can cancel the R's, and then phi hat dot phi hat is the dot product of two uh, unit vectors pointing in the same direction. So that's just one. So we just get left with the integral of d phi over the path. And if you look at these two different paths, we can define our angles in such a way so that this yellow line here will give us plus pi for the angle, which is the change of angle around that is going to be plus pi, and the white line minus pi. So this path, the, the integral over the path, or g, depending on the path, is q phi of 2h bar with either a positive or a negative sign in front of that. So if this is the phase factor by which we transform the wave function, then you can potentially get a positive or a negative sign in the exponent of that phase factor when you move a particle around these two paths. So let's say you do an experiment where you have a solenoid in the middle and you fire two electrons at the solenoid, but one of them you sort of pull around by 180 degrees round one side and the other electron you pull around the other side. Then one of them will get a phase factor transforming its wave function as it goes round the full 180 degrees to the other side, which has a positive factor in the exponent. And the other one that's gone round the other side, so one of them's going round the yellow, one of them's going round the white, the other one will get a negative sign. Now you look at this and you think, why, why is that useful? Why, why is that an interesting thing to find out? It turns out this is of huge importance to understanding why quantum mechanics is so different to classical mechanics. Because this region that the electrons were moving through in this experiment that we've designed had the magnetic field being equal to zero everywhere. And the magnetic field is an observable physical quantity. But in classical mechanics, the magnetic vector potential, A, is not. And the reason why that is is because A has some gauge freedom, right? You can transform A by adding on the gradient of some scalar potential. So there's, a, there's freedom over how we want to define A, but we will always get the same magnetic field out from the calculation. And because there's this freedom associated with the magnetic vector potential, that means that the vector potential in classical mechanics is just a mathematical construct that we use in calculations to make life easier for ourselves. It doesn't have any physical significance. And in classical mechanics, the field, and not the potential, is the thing that has physical meaning here. But now we've discovered an experiment that we can do, and has been done, and people have verified these phase factors by passing two electrons around the solenoid and interfering their wave functions prove that the wave functions are different based on which direction you go around the solenoid. We've managed to find some physical observable that does depend on, although it doesn't depend exactly on the vector potential, the observable can be different as a result of the magnetic field, even when the electrons are confined only to regions that have no magnetic field. So somehow, this magnetic field is showing up in quantum mechanics in regions that the particles are not going to. Now that's sort of one interpretation of it. The other interpretation, um, as I said before, is that the potentials actually are of more important significance physically when you study quantum mechanics than the fields are, right? In quantum mechanics, the fields are, are kind of meaningless. Just saying that a field is zero somewhere doesn't mean anything. Uh, because the vector potential associated with that field could still have some physical uh, significance for the experiment that you're doing. So there's these two completely different paradigms 
between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, where in one of them, the potentials are completely, uh, they have no physical relevance whatsoever. They're, they can purely only be a mathematical construct. But in quantum mechanics, it's the vector potentials rather than the fields that actually carry the physical uh, significance for our experiment. And that's why the aharonov bohm effect uh, has been remembered as such an important discovery in quantum mechanics, because it's one of a few examples um, of discoveries in quantum mechanics that really show how quantum mechanics differs from classical mechanics. And for this discovery, Yakir Aharonov, um, back in the 90s, was awarded the Wolf Prize in Physics, which is known, uh, widely regarded, as the second most important prize in physics after the Nobel Prize. Um, so this has gone down in history as one of the most important discoveries in quantum mechanics of the last century. Um, so this has been a, a sort of introductory video to the aharonov bohm effect. I would like to follow this up with more videos uh, studying similar things, that, uh, like similar geometric effects that you get in quantum mechanics, um, because these sort of effects are becoming more and more important as research goes on. Um, and people are, are even designing things called topological quantum computers, where these kind of phase factors that you get by moving things around systems um, can actually be used uh, to perform the operations of a quantum computer. So I hope you'll join me for those later videos. Thank you very much for watching.